of grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, Lent, if Lent is known for anything in our culture, it's that time of year you're supposed to give up stuff. I think most people know that because it's so strange. I mean, who really wants to give things up? In our world, we try to get more things, not get rid of them. I mean, yes, sometimes we try to get rid of problems or we try to declutter, but overall, I think most people like their lives. Most people like the stuff they have. So why should we get rid of it? I think for some people, it's because they see Lent as kind of a a churchy do-over of their failed New Year's resolutions. It's that time of year that they think about things they should or shouldn't do and decide to make a change. But it's even better than New Year's resolutions. Because those resolutions are supposed to last all year long. And 52 weeks is a really long time. That's probably why a lot of people give up on them within two weeks of the new year. But Lent is only six and a half weeks. Right? So some people think, oh, I can go without chocolate or coffee or sugar for six and a half weeks. That's easy. That's no big deal. I can do that. Plus, they know that come Easter Sunday, they get to have those things all over again. So it's like, congratulations, you spent six and a half weeks without chocolate. Now bite the head off this chocolate bunny. Or, if you want to be really technical about it and look for a loophole, the 40 days in Lent don't count the Sundays. Because Sundays are always a feast day. So you could argue that technically you can still have that thing on Sundays. But honestly, if... Waiting six and a half weeks just to start something again, or finding a loophole, is what you're after, then you've kind of missed the point. The reason for giving things up is because you're getting rid of something that stands in the way of your relationship with God. If chocolate or coffee or sugar or whatever do that, then fine. Okay, get rid of it. But I highly doubt they do for most people. I doubt that Reese Cups and Starbucks are getting in the way of their relationship with God. The point of giving something up is, well, to get rid of it for good. Not just for six and a half weeks. Giving something up for Lent does not mean giving it up for the duration of Lent. It means giving it up for the sake of Lent. Let me say that again. Giving up something for Lent does not mean giving it up for the duration of Lent. It means giving it up for the sake of Lent. In other words, If you can spend six and a half weeks not doing this thing, then guess what? You've just developed a new habit. And you won't want to pick it up again. The point is not to wait a month and a half just so you can do the thing again on Easter Sunday. The point is to use this season to get rid of it completely. If you can last a month and a half without it, then chances are pretty good you can go longer. In today's gospel reading, we hear about the importance of giving things up. Just before this scene, Peter confessed that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And then Jesus tells them what that means. It means that he must suffer and die and rise again. Then he called the crowd of his disciples and said to them, If anyone to become my followers, let them deny themselves 
and take up their cross and follow me. There it is. Deny yourself. Notice that Jesus didn't say, deny yourself chocolate or coffee or sugar or whatever else. He said, deny yourself. Deny your own desires and impulses and plans. Deny thinking that you're the one in charge. Deny thinking that you don't need to change. And take up your cross. Embrace your mortality. Follow Jesus unto death. Realize that you're not the one in control. Now, in our heads, that sounds fine. And in our heads, we know that following Jesus is hard. We know that he calls us to follow. We know that discipleship's a challenge. But in practice, it's not really all that attractive, is it? I mean, think about if this were a a recruitment tool for new disciples. Or imagine if this was how a church tried to get new members. Come join St. Paul Lutheran Church. As part of this community, your life will be devoid of pleasures. You won't get to have any fun and you won't have any joy in life. Instead, you'll get a giant dose of pain, suffering, and death. But you'll really be Christian. So can we expect to see you on Sunday? No, come on. That's just ridiculous. Who would want to be a part of that? When people look for a church community, they want something attractive. Right? They want something comfortable and easy. Something that will make them happy. Like, maybe they go church shopping because they want to find that one church that will meet all their criteria. Maybe it has this program, or this kind of music, or this political meaning. Maybe, maybe they want to get something out of worship. As if worship were all about them instead of about God. Maybe it has X, Y, and Z that will make their lives easier and more comfortable. They think, if I'm going to commit myself to following Jesus, then I want to make sure I get something good out of it. If it doesn't help me, then why not? What's Jesus going to do for me? And in a way, that's where Peter was. He confessed that Jesus was the Messiah. He got that much right. And Jesus told him that he was going to suffer and die. But then Peter pulled him aside. Now we aren't told what Peter said, but only that he rebuked Jesus. So I can imagine him saying something like, You've got it all wrong, Jesus. That's not how you're supposed to work. You're not supposed to suffer and die. You're supposed to get rid of those who bring suffering and death. You're supposed to kick out the Romans and make our lives better. We're counting on you to make our lives safer and more comfortable. We want you to improve the quality of our lives, not call us to die with you. You've got it all wrong here. Jesus then tells him, get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Peter, like so many Christians today, had the consumer mindset. He thought, what can Jesus do for me? What can I get out of it? What's in it for me here? But Christians have never been called to be consumers. Because that's the human mindset. 
We're called to sacrifice for the sake of others. Because that's the divine grace. Jesus calls us to deny ourselves. Just like he denies himself. As he says, For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. So yes, in following Jesus, we do get life. That's true. But it doesn't come easy. And some people wonder why they should bother with it at all. I mean, it's so much easier to just think of yourself instead of others, right? And yet, there are some people who do take discipleship very seriously. There are some people who definitely lose their lives in order to find their lives. They clearly put others before themselves. But why? Right? If you think giving up coffee or chocolate or sugar for, your, for a few weeks sounds strange, then denying yourself for the sake of others sounds completely ridiculous. Why would anybody want to do that? Well, because of love. And I know I've used this metaphor before, but it's worth saying again. Discipleship is a lot like parenting. Why do people willingly choose this hard task of parenting? Why do they give themselves for their children? Why do they choose to rearrange their entire lives for their kids? They could be selfish and ignore them. There are plenty of parents who do that. But those who take it seriously, those who give themselves and sacrifice for their kids, they do it because of love. Many loving parents say that they would lay down their lives for their kids. And many of them do. Maybe they don't actually die in order that their kids might have life, but they do make great sacrifices. Sometimes it's been said that parenting is the hardest and the most rewarding job in the world. Discipleship works the same way. My friends, it is really, really hard, but you also find a life you never knew before, a life that you wouldn't trade for anything. And both of these things, discipleship and parenting, are fueled by love. This is what giving things up really means. It's about sacrificing yourself because you love the one who's in relationship with you. And what's even better is that Jesus sacrifices because he loves I know we've all heard that before, but we need to hear it over and over again. Sometimes we forget it or ignore it or we think it's irrelevant, but please think about it. <clears throat> Jesus didn't give up coffee or chocolate or sugar. He gave up himself totally and completely for you. You who are frail and sinful and mortal. You who know what it's like to love your own kids. Jesus chose to die for you. Jesus loves you even more than you love your kids. 
And more than that, he chose to rise again for you. Because he loves you. Lent is not about pausing a certain behavior for six and a half weeks. Lent is about how Jesus gave up majesty and power and might. How he gave up his throne and crown, as they say, to come to you in your broken world and die. Because he loves you. So maybe the thing we can give up this Lent is thinking that the world should revolve around us. Taking up your cross and following Jesus is hard. And it was hard for him too. And yet... Jesus won't let anything, not even death, stop him from loving you. Love makes you do strange things sometimes. But that's what Lent and that's what discipleship are all about. Jesus leads the way. And now we can't help but follow. Because it's all about love. In the name of this one who goes to the cross and calls us to follow. Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.